Okay. Hi, I'm Sue Bogan. Welcome to sunny Alabama. Um, I'm a transplanted Minnesotan and that's where I started my craft because there's a lot of birch bark up there and this is what I do. Um, I started out in 1991 with just really plain frames um, and then since it's really tedious and boring, which is something I'm very good at, um, I had a lot of time to think and it's just been a natural progression, anyway to me natural since then. Um, I started out making frames that were pretty plain and then from there I thought, oh I don't need to do just frames, I can put cork in them. And from there it kind of went to, oh look at all these cool stones and stuff and what am I going to do with my leftover scraps because I just really don't like waste. So it went into where I add stones, and these are um, die cuts out of birch bark and um, cedar leaves, and some of them have little bits of schmutz and whatever that I picked up from the forest. And then I started in with these right here, putting studs on them. And then my latest thing is these smaller frames. They're very simple and inexpensive, and they're made for people that get a lot of pictures and want to change them all the time like grandma's so these are really easy to change and you just put in a new one so anyway this is what I do um, and Cody my cameraman why don't we step over and show the folks the first step okay this is where it all starts um, I as dimension lumber when I lived um, in Minnesota, I'm near Two Harbors, I knew some contractors and they used to give me their scrap lumber. They used perfectly good 12 foot long pieces of 1x4 or 1x6 to do bracing and then when the job was done they ripped it out and threw it in the dumpster and I said, no, don't do that, give it to me. So they did. But I'm not in Minnesota anymore. So from here I have to rip the board to the width of whatever frame that I'm making and um, at this point in time, I'm making 8 by 10s So what I have done is ripped it to 2 and a half inches, which is, this is the width of the frames of the 8 by 10s And then when I get done with that, I have templates, and I cut and mark all the little pieces. So here, I'll show you. I kind of have my earmuffs on. I'm almost deaf as it is, so I like to preserve whatever hearing I have left. I've already set this up for a piece for, this is the 10 inch piece. So I just line it up, make sure it's square. And, <laughs> and voila! So now that I've got, pretend I have my four pieces cut, I have to cut the channels for the glass and the backer board to rest. So why don't we move on to that step? Okay, here we are at the trusty cable saw. And the next step, and like I said, is to cut the channels for the glass and your art to sit in. So once again, hearing protection. I'm just gonna make four quick passes
with things called V-nails. And this is probably the strongest way of doing this. Oh dear, here. Ah, there we go, now that I messed that up. But anyway, they come like this, but they're, they're just little tiny things and shoot into the thing. And I tell you, you have to hammer the joint apart when um, you use an underpinner. I started out using dowels, I would join the frame like this, and then I would drill down and put a couple of dowels in, and that was acceptable. This whole thing has been a learning experience. And from there I went to biscuit joinery, which was a lot better, but it still wasn't good enough because if the wood was twisted or warped in any way, and sometimes that would happen from the time I brought it home from the um, lumber yard to where I got it into my shop and worked with it. Um, that was, un it just wasn't good. So then my friend Cindy Ryder, who I owe a lot to, um, had a frame shop and she said, well, why don't you come over and use my underpinner? And I said, oh, okay. I did and I fell in love with it. And so about five years after that, I had to go out and get one of my own. So anyway, what we do, is put a little glue on the ends and then we come over here and line it up pretty good and then there's a foot pedal here it's it's pneumatic it's air powered and we just go and there you go up perfectly joined frame. So let me just finish this here. It's amazing how much better a product that you can have and how much easier and less time consuming it is when you have the right tool. this entire frame together um, took me what less than a minute had I done it the old-fashioned way with the dowels um, I would have glued it first and then drilled it it probably would have taken me about 15 with the biscuit joiner same thing so this is like a real time saver more time for the light bubbles so then when we have our frame together Okay, now that we have our frame put together, it's time to stain. But before I do that, Cody pointed out to me that when I was cutting these channels that I didn't have my setup like it should have been, and the cut was bad. So while I was off camera, I went and fixed it. So, because it's either right or it's wrong. And then also, while I was doing that, after I did that, I also sanded. I don't know if you can tell the difference. People have told me over the years, I know you don't need to sand. But see the difference in the two? This is the before and this is after. 
And one thing I've learned in making these is preparation is everything, especially surface prep. So there you have it. So there we go. On to the staining. Whoops, I better stir that. What I do with these to get a better color, a richer color, is um, I let the can settle so the pigment is on the bottom and then the oil is on the top. And then I skim off probably a third of the oil so the color ends up much richer and darker than it had just, I had just let, let it be. Of course, you know me, Cody, I can't let anything just be. So, what you do with this stuff, and this is just about foolproof, this stain. I like it, it gives good coverage, it gives good color, and it seems to last. I got frames that I made in 1991, um, when I first started, that looked just about as good, if I dust them, than they did uh, the day I put it on. So I'm not going to bore you with watching me stain the whole frame because that's boring. So it's like watching paint dry. We don't need that. So anyway, when I'm done with this, then I will come back off camera and I will wipe this off. You leave it set for, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. So when you get everything all stained, then you come over here and I have my wonderful templates again. And I am not organized enough to do an 8x10 for this demonstration, so I picked out a 5x7. Oh, no, wait. I'm jumping the gun, aren't I? No, I'm not. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. Keep filming. Rolling. <laughs> so anyway, I put this template down, and I've marked where the hole should be. And then I just come along with my ice pick. Yeah, yeah. And mark the holes. I don't think this is my ice pick with the real narrow tip. I got three of these ice picks. They belong to my husband's, God rest his soul, Uncle Clem, who worked at the Minneapolis Ice Plant. And in the 30s and 40s, when they still went out on Lake Calhoun and cut blocks of ice, and I thought, oh, how perfect for marking holes. But not because... My holes are too small and I don't want to search for the ice pick with the skinny tip. So then I would just go back and do that. And you can see where the holes are marked. So anyway, that's it for staining. <clears throat> Except, oh, for all you woodworkers out there, um, I'm not being paid by any of these companies, but I believe in giving a tip when I can. Minwax has come out with a stain that's called True Black, which is really true black. A lot of times because um, pine absorbs stain differently depending on the species, you end up with a different color than what you wanted. Um, most of the time I would end up with kind of a dark coffee brown, which was if somebody wants black, that won't work. But Minwax True Black, um, it's true black every time. Okay, enough of that. So after we're doing this, then we get to the bark, the important part. So I'll take my gloves off, and if you want to just follow me, we'll go out to my bark pile. Okay, here we are out at my bark pile. Um, to get the bark, I get it along the North Shore of Lake Superior um, because I only use bark from dead trees and Minnesota has a very unhealthy birch population. Bad for the trees, good for me. I will not use bark from live trees. So anyway, I go out there and scrounge around in the wood and I get as much as I can. I have a, a five day to two week window in both the spring and the fall to get the bark. In the spring, I have to wait until everything's thawed, the snow is gone, but before it's greened up and the bugs have come out. Uh, I've missed that and it's not a happy experience. In the fall it's the same thing only in reverse. I have to wait for all the leaves to leave, <laughs> no pun intended, leave the trees and before it snows. I've also missed that and it's not fun prying stuff off the ground with a crowbar. So anyway, um, once I get it done, my life comes to a standstill while I take it home and process it. 
because being that it's from dead trees, the back of the bark is covered with all kinds of stuff. Dead cambium, um, dirt, uh, insects, insect houses, all kinds of crap, and it all has to be scraped off. So I scrape it, and then I flatten it on the ground, and then I weight it down and just leave it there for a while. And because once it's flat and it's dry, it'll stay there forever. I can just throw it in a pile and forget about it. And so I'm going to have to go back to Minnesota here pretty soon, and I think I'm going to be in the heat and the bugs because I missed the window. But my friend Cindy Ryder, who I have to plug because she's helped me so much, lets me stay at her hotel, which is the Northern Mail Train Car Motel in Two Harbors, Minnesota, and it's wonderful. It's a hotel made with train cars, box cars. So anyway, I come over to my pile here. And if I run screaming, it's because I've seen a bug, a cockroach that's huge, so just, yeah. Anyway, I dig through this, and I secretly came out last night and picked out some appropriate pieces to save time. So anyway, I grabbed my bark. Okay, here, we're back. I had to take a little break there. I'm very nervous, and Cody had to kind of reel me in. So anyway. So the next step is to cut strips to tack onto the frames. And I used to flip them over and had a template and draw the line and cut them out. My hand would cramp and I have to stop and blah, blah, blah. So this I found at an online auction for an incredibly reasonable price. So I've already done a straight edge on it. And what I do then is line it up and I cut these a little bit wider than they have to be just so I have some wiggle room. Oh, wait a minute. Is that right? So there we go. And then <coughs> So now I have my pieces cut. And the next step is to take my templates again and figure out the best, the nicest piece. And mark it off. Of course I grab the defective shears and then cut it out. Oops. I do that four times, two ten, two eight, and then when that's finished, then I come over here to where I tack the bark on. And one thing I have to watch out for is like this piece here has a lot of holes in it, so I have to make sure that the the frame under the holes is stained. I didn't want to bother with it. I hope this is hot. And then I just draw on some glue. And you gotta work rather quickly, although I don't know here, Minnesota you had to work quickly because the glue got cold really fast. But here, it's a dang hot. I don't think it matters. So once that's glued on, or tacked on, then I have to cut the excess off. Being careful not to cut into the wood, but if that happens, I got a fix for that too. So, and once I've got all four sides on, then I make little corner pieces and I've done different styles. I just happen to like this one, so this is what I'm using lately. So, then you just position that, glue it on trim it off if it needs it on the end and now you have your bark on so I can show you what the next step is if you're interested um, if not just shut off right now <laughs> okay here we are at the drill press I love my nephew he's wonderful he's keeping me together through this whole thing anyway here we are we're going to drill the holes that I marked a little bit ago <laughs> I did 
most of them before, once again, just so I didn't bore you. So now we go on to back to the staging area and I show you what happens next. Okay, now that we have the holes drilled, I just don't like the looks of it, even though it's the back of the frame. So I take my stain and go over the whole frame again, really, and wipe it off. And then this is what you end up with, something that's, that's a lot richer and deeper and darker and there's no white marks and, and what. And uh, so then you're ready for the next step, which is to do the edging. Um, I use two different kinds. I use these little sticks that I cut out from scrap lumber and or I use dowels um, on a frame this size and bigger. I use eighth inch and three sixteenths die to match. And then one thing that I realized I forgot to do that I have to do is you want to dab the ends. So I'm just going to dab one end. Well, I'm here, so I'll dab two ends to come back and use that. And then wipe it off because I don't like the white showing. So I will take, and I've already cut these to length again. You don't need to watch me cut stuff. And so now what I'm going to do is take it over to my desk and lace. Over the years, I found places that have different colored sinew. This is artificial sinew. It's the same stuff that they use to make um, dream catchers. That's the word I was looking for. So I take my piece. And I'm using sticks just because it's a lot easier to line up one stick than it is two dowels. And I just start lacing away. This is a good project for cold winter nights. <laughs> and I just do this all the way around. And then when I come back over, tie a knot in there and then poke it down into the hole so it doesn't show. And I'm finished. And this is what it looks like when I'm finished. Um, I finished the bag. Oh, this doesn't have it. But anyway, um, I put sawtooth hangers on them and I use screws instead of nails. And then also, I've just recently gone to turn buttons. Cody, we're going to have to go back over here. Anyway, I just recently went to turn buttons. So when it's much easier to change the picture, um, to turn a button than it is to pry those little things up. So I put the, the glass in, then a little thing about the process of making the frame and backerboard and cardboard and whatever else I need. And um, turn the buttons and there you have it. So. Um, that's how you make a frame. Now you can either go, oh, I can do that, and you could, or you can say, oh, let's get 